Okay, moving on to part C of question 37. Okay, so then in question uh, part C, they asked you, based on the table, which block has the greatest mass? Use energy conversion to explain your answer. So in fact, right, from this, right, a few things. I will do my annotation. I will break this up into three key areas. Now, the first thing you realize is that you need to select something, correct? You need to, they ask you which block. So because you need to select something, you can use the strategy of CER. Something that we have been drilling about many times. So C stands for claim, E stands for evidence, R stands for reasoning. Okay, I'm going to say it one more time so you understand. Now, C is whichever one you choose. So block X, Y, or Z. E is the evidence that is based on the table. So you have to quote evidence. Okay? You have to state the results given. So this is where students are unable to do so. So instead of telling me what the table will say, students will just go, oh, block X has the greatest mass. Without telling me anything about the distance. And that was the major error that most of y'all made in this paper. Y'all didn't tell me about the greatest distance move. Nothing. Right? So where is your evidence? It needs to be based on the table. Strangely enough, many of you didn't say that. Don't have. Then after that, I need to then talk about greatest mass. A lot of you, once again, use the superlative greater. That is the wrong form. Why? Because over here you have three blocks. So assuming that you put Y, which is the correct answer, and, it say, and you say that, oh, its mass is greater than, okay, or the greater um, the mass is, okay, the faster the car moves, something like that. But greater than what? Than X or than Z? Wrong. It's supposed to be greatest. And this is another very common mistake that you are still making at this juncture. Which you cannot afford. And you should not be if you have taken your work seriously and have understood that the importance of superlative, which I've been stressing since day one. Take a good look at your answer. Okay? Then after that, they said to use energy conversion. So I told you already, okay, I already told you many times, this is very important. Whenever they give you this kind, right, it means that you need to refer back to this flow chart diagram to help you answer the question. In fact, this would have been very easy if you just follow this flow chart. How? So let me explain to you. Now the answer is going to be why. Why? So I could C E R right. So C, answer why. Evidence. Okay. I would say that. Okay. The distance traveled. Okay. Using block Y is the greatest. Right. This suggests that. Y has the greatest mass so that it has the greatest amount of gravitational potential energy to be converted to the greatest amount of kinetic energy of the falling weight and then to be converted to the greatest kinetic energy of the turning wheel. 
working, I would have then gotten full marks. Just like that. Nothing very difficult. But you all lost mark because you could not see and were very careless. So this kind of thing, you really need to be careful. So how will it look like? So my C. Why? My evidence. Okay. The toy car move the greatest distance or the furthest distance. Okay, so then after that, remember, I always like to use this term, this suggests. Alright, so this is where you can actually use the this suggests. So the this suggests part, right, it can, you can park it either under evidence or you can park it under reason, up to you. Okay, for me, I think it's better in this case to park it under reason. Sorry, just. Let me change this color pen. So this suggests that Y has the greatest mass We are? Okay, no, sorry. Can I change this part? I just want to make this edit. Park this under evidence. Okay, I think it's more clear if I just teach you all that this suggests, right? Just park it under evidence. So that is a lot more straightforward. And then after that, your reason, okay, would simply be this is because the block with the greatest mass had the most gravitational potential energy converted to the most kinetic energy of the weight okay of the falling weight and the wheel which resulted in the longest distance travel. Okay, so it's very clear. Alright, so every time you quote the evidence, right, it must be from the table. What did the table say? It says that it travels the greatest, right? So what does this suggest? It has the greatest mass. Then you explain reason why. Okay, it is because the block with the greatest mass had the most amount of okay, uh, gravitational potential energy to be converted, etc, etc, etc. So this is something very um, straightforward actually. So I'm going to need you all to watch this 10 times if you must in order to understand how to use CER properly. You should be able to do this. In fact, uh, in your answers, right, if you can break it down into CER literally, um, you, it will help you greatly. Once again, I stress, the 
key mistakes for TER is students don't quote the evidence from the table. Okay, they just give why has the greatest mass. No, you must tell me evidence and then what does this suggest. Okay. Moving on. Question 38. John conducted the experiment below. Okay. He hung different mass at the end of a similar springs so that the springs each have a set up that stretches by five. Okay. And then after that, the springs are all made of a similar material and have the same length. So the first thing you do, if you ask me, I will always want to know what is the measured variable and what is the change variable. So the first thing about it is the different mass that is being hung. This is my change variable. Okay. And my measured mass is actually what is the mass of weight required to stretch it to 5 cm. Okay. So right off the top, when I see this kind of same kind of thing, I will ask myself, what topic are they testing me on? Which concept? So when I look at this, right, straight away, okay, I start to think. I see spring. Okay, where do I see spring? Okay, I see spring either in energy, top, the topic on energy, which is talking about uh, your, il your uh, elastic potential energy. The next part that I will see a spring is your elastic spring force. So then I start to think, okay, so are they talking about energy now or are they talking more about force? Then I also realize that, okay, they've got a block here that stretches it. Then I ask myself, how come it will stretch? So in this case, it will stretch because of a force that is acting on it, right? So then this would then help me narrow down, ah, this topic is on forces, okay? So what happens is that my block Gravity is actually acting on it, pulling it down. All right, and what is changing? The mass of it. So remember, gravity is affected by your mass. The higher your mass, the higher the gravity pull. Okay, so what this tells me is that as the number of spring increases, this is one spring, two spring, three spring, there is more okay elastic spring force and because of that i have to exert a greater opposing force in order to stretch it to 5 cm so how do i how do i then uh, subject these springs to a greater opposing force i use a heavier block which is that's why in c you will notice that because it is the most number of spring, three springs, you require the heaviest weight because the heaviest weight will give you the most amount of gravity pull. You got that? Okay. So they ask you, what is the relationship between the number of springs and the mass of the block that is needed to stretch the springs by 5 cm? So when we do this kind of question, you know, right, there's a framework as, as something, something, something increases or decreases, something, something increases, decreases. The something over here is your change variable. Okay, change variable. So number of spring here is your change variable. Okay, and then this is your measured variable. So how to craft the answer? Okay, very straightforward. S the number of springs increases this is your change variable ah comma the number of sorry the mass my apologies okay the mass of block required increases okay 
Moving on. Now, this one you need to understand. So what happens is that the diver below shows an exercise equipment using springs. All right. So the man tries to stretch the springs by 30 cm by lifting the handle. So he is going in, he's exerting a force in this direction, upwards. So he's stretching the spring upwards. Okay. Now, when the man is stretching the spring, what forces is he pulling against? So this question is already very kind to you in the sense that they actually hinted to you that it's more than one force. However, I have many students writing only one force. So what are the two forces? Okay, the first most obvious force would be your gravity that is pulling everything down to earth. The second force is actually your elastic spring force, correct? So there are two that you need to say, all right? Because as he pulls upwards, your elastic spring force will be pulling it down. And that's what, that's what provides it, um, this machine, the resistance. Now, next, the man could only stretch the springs by 20 instead of 30 cm. Okay, so what does this tell me? This tells me that this man does not have enough strength and he can only do so much at 20, uh, pull up to 20 instead of 30. But his goal is to make sure he gets to 30. So how can he do that? So then the question asks you, use fewer or more exercise, they ask, so that you can stretch by 30. So the answer should be fewer, right? Now, because this is a false question, you will have to actually answer it in terms of false. Okay, so then you explain, why is that, uh, why is it that he, sh he should use fewer? So when he used fewer springs so that you explain fewer springs wait sorry can I I think it's better to structure it this way okay there is lesser elastic spring force when fewer springs are used. Now, be careful, uh, once again, it's lesser, fewer. Please don't tell me don't have. Okay, moving on. Okay, and set up the circuit shown below. The iron bar can swing about point P. Explain how the iron hammer strikes the bell when the switch is closed. Okay. So whenever I look at diagrams like that, right? Okay. Whenever I see this kind of diagram, uh, the first thing that comes to my mind, right, is always electrical circuit. Right? Very straightforward. Electrical circuit. Because I see things like batteries, I see things like bar, I see things like switch. Okay? That's the first the one thing. And then whenever I see an iron rod with coils, uh, I will annotate here as electromagnet. It's very clear cut one. It has to be an electromagnet somehow. And if there is an electromagnet, the next thing I will look for is what does this electromagnet attract? So then I realized that the next thing, I have this thing called iron bar. 
So your iron bar is the one that is at, attracted to your electromagnet. And when this happens, I know that my iron hammer will go upwards. It will hit the bell. Right? Okay, that is what will happen when the switch closes. Okay? So, next. So this is just about my prior knowledge. I haven't read the question yet. Ah. Okay, I can choose to do this while I am interpret when I just reach and do this point. Okay, or I can choose to read, finish the whole thing, then I try and understand this diagram. There are reasons why I like to try and understand a diagram first before I read the question. There are also advantage if I read the whole question, then I try to understand the diagram. Why I try to understand a diagram first is so that I can better understand the question. Because I already know already what electric circuit, okay, I have an electromagnet here, okay, when is this is turned on, and then my iron bar is supposed to be attracted to this, and with this, I will hit the bell. So it gives me some prior knowledge, some context. And then when I go on to reading the question, okay, iron bar can swing about point P. Ah, okay, correct. Explain how the iron bar strikes when the bell switch is closed. So because even before reading the question, I already sort of understood how this whole thing works. Straight away, I didn't know already. Oh, okay. It's because when the switch is closed, an electromagnet is formed. Okay. So how do I then answer this? Straight off the top, I know it's an electrical circuit. I will use C E O. Okay, something that never fails. C stands for whether or not your circuit is closed or open. E stands for whether your electric current can flow through. O stands for what is the outcome. Okay, so you need to say everything. I know this, this is only worth one mark, but guess what? This question can be worth up to two marks. And that's why you need to write the full answer. Okay, so how does this work? Okay, I'm going to show you. So C. So when the switch is closed, the circuit is closed or complete. This is your first C. Your E, electric currents. can flow through this just don't say flow through uh. flow through what? flow through the circuit after it flows through the circuit this is your second E uh, your second one, your E then you talk about the outcome what does it do? okay causing the iron rod to become an electromagnet which attracts the word attracts need to be there, attracts the iron is it called an iron hammer? yes, iron hammer okay causing it to strike because they ask you to strike muscle so it because when it attracts so this is how you do ceo okay we've done this many times but i just want to be explicit about it next when n closed the switch the light bulb lit up but the iron bar did not move to strike the bell give a possible reason why the iron bar did not move now for this question a lot of students say things that are very too general you have mentioned things like oh not enough electrical energy battery was too weak though you are not wrong you are being very general general with your answer Whenever you attempt questions, you should always ask yourself, has your teacher ever taught you things like not enough energy, 
battery too weak. Oh, some of you even said this. Electromagnet, strength of electromagnet was too weak. So whatever you're saying is too general. Your teacher don't ever teach you things like that one. Your teacher will teach you things that are very specific and tangible. So for example, when you're telling me not enough electrical energy, what you're actually saying is that there is not enough batteries, right? And on top of that, when you say, oh, the electromagnet not strong enough. So remember when we talk about strength, we are talking about how easily an item can be broken. So how, how does, you know, um, whether or not your electromagnet can be broken easily has got to do with the attraction. No, the magnetic strength. Correct? So when you talk about the magnetic strength, right, then you need to ask yourself, why is it that this el the, el the magnetic strength of this particular electromagnet is not strong enough? Then you look at it, it's an electromagnet. Two causes. One is either there's not enough batteries to provide, you know, enough electrical energy. Or two, there's not enough coils. So they are actually testing you on, okay, factors affecting um, uh, magnetic strength of electromagnet. That is what they're testing you on. So what do you need to say? You need to be specific. You have to say... Okay, either there are not enough battery That's the first thing you can you can say or the second one would be There are not enough coins Around The iron rod you see that it's actually application on what you have learned in P4. So don't go crafting your own general statements. Next. Anne was given one more switch and some wires to set up her circuit again. Okay. So highlight one switch some wires the circuit she set up must meet the following conditions when the bulb fuses the iron hammer will still strike the bell okay both electromagnet and the bulb can be controlled individually complete the circuit diagram to show how and should set up her circuit so because this is circuit diagram okay and they're using symbols you need to use symbols now these two conditions right will tell you what how it's supposed to be arranged and at the same time what uh where the switch is supposed to be placed so the fact that they tell you when it fuses the other one will still work tells me that this two needs to be arranged in a parallel circuit they need to be parallel to each other. That's the first thing that comes to my mind. Then after that, the second thing they tell you must be controlled individually, right? Meaning that the way you put your switch, right, cannot be in the pathway whereby electric current must flow through one to reach the other. It cannot be a common pathway. It has to be a private pathway. What do I mean by that? I will explain to you. So the first thing I know, it definitely is in a parallel. Now, I'm going to draw for you roughly first because I want to show you my thinking thoughts, uh, my thoughts out loud. I will then clean this diagram up for you to show you how is it exactly supposed to be drawn in exam standards. So the first thing I know is, okay, these two definitely must be parallel to each other. No other way around it. So, no need to see already. Okay, this is parallel. This has to be parallel. Can you see now that this is parallel to this? The parallel lines, if you cannot, I draw it up for you. 
tell me you know what are these arrows ah? that means these two are parallel lines okay that's it then the next thing is where do i put my switch so remember i told you it cannot be in a pathway whereby it is common because if the switch is common right okay what am i common so can you see it always move from positive to negative right so i cannot place my switch anywhere here why to reach the bar i need to go through here all right to reach the magnet i need to go through here so can you see that from here to here this is common do you realize that it's common whether i want to go to my electromagnet or I want to go to my bar okay it has the flow through this area here it also has to okay flow through this area here when i want to reach my electro uh, electromagnet so because of that i cannot put my switch here it's a no 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 go so i'm going to highlight this in green this is common area and then after that you realize there's a second common area in order for your because it goes in a complete way right this portion over here sorry from here to here is also common because whether i'm coming from my bar back to my uh, battery or from my electromagnet back to my battery i must go through here so this is another big no-no okay in fact i tell you what i use red color to tell you cannot red zone so then very straightforward idea what if i want to control my box individually i can only put in my switches anywhere here right oh dear give me a second you need to draw back okay i can put i need to put it within this line this is the private line exclusive line to the bulb that is not common and then after that for my um what you call that? for my electromagnet same thing this is not common so i can put my switch here so actually i can choose to put my switch for my electric uh, for my light bulb uh, anywhere on this line because this is an exclusive line exclusive wire you realize that anywhere i'm just putting it here because i'm happy i'm not happy i can put here also or here or here or here or here or here or here wherever but please do not put it right next to a component don't put your switch right next to a component i mean it will work uh. it will work but come on then your examiner is going to have a very hard time to mark and don't put it at the corner here please ah uh. no don't put it at the corner don't, don't cause unnecessary confusion okay leave at least like a 1 cm gap okay so anywhere from here to here here to here similarly for your electromagnet i can put the switch anywhere from here to here okay that is fine i hope i'm clear so any one of this switch um so when the bulb fuses then you check will it still go through yeah when the bulb fuses i can no longer come here but i can still continue to go no issue and these two are controlled individually so how do i draw this in real life what are the main things that i need to be careful of Give me a second, ah. Uh. Try clear this up. So if I'm going to draw this for real in exam, I need to be careful of a few things. So once I have this out uh, mentally, you can draw it at the side or whatever. Okay, you should always use a pencil. And you need to have very straight lines. And some of you very interesting instead of joining um over here right 
you choose to join it to here. That means your your um wire right you stuck it to your 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 mat your your iron core directly instead of to the wires. Yeah, you don't laugh. Okay, some of you really did that. I'm appalled by it. Okay, this is how it should look like. Straight lines, pencil, no gaps. Okay, very straightforward. Next, question 40. The diagram below shows a match being lit. Okay, when the matchstick is rubbed against the striking surface of the matchbox, the matchstick catches fire. So, a few things. Right off the top of my mind, I see things like rubbed against. I see things catch fire. So, this will hit me to friction. And this will hit me to heat. Okay, in, in my mind, when I do annotation, it should be that. So name the force that enables the matchstick to catch fire. It's very straightforward, right? You already annotated its friction. And some more they tell you is force. So this will, and, and then you think about it, how many type of forces did we learn? Okay, we learned about um, gravitational force, we learned about elastic spring force, we've learned about um, magnetic force, we learned about frictional force. So basically out of this, Forces that a list of forces that you learn. Which one? Which is the most applicable? Frictional. Okay, that will help you make sure that you get a correct answer. Then they ask you explain how the force in A causes the matchstick to catch fire. So already you annotated. Okay, for fire to happen, there must be heat. Then you think about it. Ah, I know. Because when friction happens between two surfaces, heat is being produced. It's as simple as that. But once again, many of you did not bother to put the between. Friction is a contact force. I have stressed this umpteen times. But yet, many students simply cannot write that down. Okay, so you need to put that down. So you need to say that friction between the matchstick and the striking surface produces heat that caused the fire. Okay? Next. It was observed that after a while, the striking surface of, of the matchbox was smooth. When I see the word smooth or smoother, I know that there is a decrease in friction. Right? So I'm going to annotate that. Would it be easier for the matchstick to catch fire when the striking surface is smooth? So when there is less friction, it also means that there is less heat that is being produced. So if there's less heat, isn't it more difficult to catch fire, right? So you have to answer, no. There will be less friction between the striking surface and the matchstick. Matchstick is one word. Hence, this will lead, okay, or will produce less heat. Okay. 
So because there's less heat, okay, uh, fire becomes harder to start.